This is the I Am A Mainframer podcast, brought to you by the Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe Project. Episodes explore the careers of mainframe professionals and offer insights into the industry and technology. Now your host, Senior Analyst and Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Futurum Research, Stephen Dickens. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Stephen Dickens, and I'm joined today by a dear friend, neighbor, and former colleague, Misty Decker of Microfocus. Hey, Misty, welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. It's kind of odd being on a, a, a Zoom conversation with you after so many years of having offices like right next door and living a mile away. But you know what? We'll do it this way. <laughs> we should, uh, As I said in this sort of preamble before the show, we should have done this either at my house or a coffee shop in town. I actually recommended that we do it um, on a walk by the river. Cause, that would have know, been nice. I might have sort of made people a bit seasick as I bounced <laughs> up and down on a camera, but we should have done that. No, next time, next time. We'll do it. We'll do yeah, round two. So just to, for our listeners and viewers, Misty and I live about a mile away from each other. Yeah. My oldest daughter and Misty's daughter went through high school together and are friends. So this is kind of <laughs> – if this goes into two neighbors chatting, I apologize in advance. All right. We just no daughters are off limits because I'm pretty sure they would kill us. <laughs> I, I think you're probably right. So, yeah, like, professional hat. Yes. Yes. Mm. So, let's get the listeners and viewers orientated. Misty, I know you're, what you do for Microfocus, but I think it'd be really good to get you to go there first and then maybe give us a bit of a career arc of what got you to microfocus oh great okay so i am currently uh the director of product marketing at microfocus um uh, microfocus has a full range of software products you know security analytics data management devops um but i'm in um i'm director of our um application modernization and connectivity division that's a lot of words uh it basically means mainframes and anything that's core to the enterprise so uh as Director of Product Marketing, I, you know, manage the messaging and what we say about these products, and and I call myself a mainframe evangelist because, or a modernization evangelist, because a lot of what I do is just trying to explain to the mainframe community and to the non-mainframe community what modernization is and help each side understand the other. So um, that's that's pretty much what I do is. I, I, I consider it trying to help people find common ground uh, when it comes to moving forward with their IT systems. Fantastic. And I know, as I say, when we were goofing around at the beginning of the show, you and I have known each other for a while now. How did you end up at Microfocus? The show's called I'm a Mainframer. Kind of plot a little bit of that story arc and that career journey, if you would. Well, it's really kind of a funny story because I became a mainframer um, because I couldn't afford grad school and I'd never been on a plane before. So that is my journey. Um, Isn't that I, how all good journeys start? <laughs> because you, you've you never been on a plane. I wanted to be a research mathematician and I paid my own way through college and got my undergraduate degree and to be a researcher, you have to have a PhD and I couldn't afford it. And a girlfriend of mine said, go work for one of these big companies and they will pay for your master's degree while you're earning money. So I interviewed only with companies that offered graduate reimbursement programs. And I pretended to like computers because I didn't <laughs> um, just to get the job. And I'm from Virginia. I had no intention of moving to New York, but IBM said they would fly me to New York for the interview. And I took the interview only to get on the plane. 100% true. The only reason I took the I interview. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's a great story. <laughs> was because I wanted to be on a plane for once in my life. And so there I am, 21 years old, on a plane for my first time in my life. And I get off the plane and it was, I kid you not, 25 degrees below freezing here in New York, a girl from Virginia, uh, getting off the tarmac in Newburgh, New York, 
And I took my jacket off and I went, this is amazing. I had never felt anything so cold before in my life. Um, and it was, it was kind of thrilling, but the reason I took the job, even though I had an offer with GE Aerospace was because the people were so nice. They were so organized. And I figured I'm only going to be at IBM for a couple of years. I can live in New York for a couple of years. What's the big deal? So 30 years later, uh, you know, IBM grew on me, mainframes grew on me. Um, instead of getting a master's in math, I got a master's in information systems. It just, this technology was so impressive. And the things I was able to get involved in and do, um, and the leadership opportunities I was given very early on in my career. I mean, I was leading teams after only a year or two in the company and I got tapped to be in the very first class of certified project managers. Um, I got tapped to, to be the release manager for the very first release of ZOS. You know, I, I was able to do a lot of really interesting things. And so I kind of got sucked in. I still wonder if in an alternative universe, if Misty, um, the mathematician, has discovered some really interesting math. But uh, that is no longer my path. <laughs> we need a multiverse to sort of get right? you to come through and, and sort of explore that. And, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned that you got the opportunity to do a number of different things. That was my experience of working for IBM, only 10 years, but that was my experience. Maybe just sort of give it – we get a lot of female listeners to the show. We get a lot of people who are kind of look of how do I plot a career through this technology. I no. think you've got a fantastic – perspective on both of those things so maybe just expand a little bit on some of the opportunities that this platform's given you over the years so i started in uh what's known as system build where the job was to plan the install path which is a lot of logic and reasoning because in the mainframe you can pick and choose individual patches that you're going to install as opposed to in a Windows where it's like in a Windows update, which is like a whole bucket and you either install it or you don't. So there's a lot of logic and reasoning. That's how I got in the door. But but I found I was in my usual pushy self. I was I was getting involved in some leadership opportunities just because I saw projects happening and it was that it just bugs me when people are planning a project and they they say, I know what the users want, but they never go and ask the users. So I said, well, can we just go and ask them, please? <laughs> so I led a number of initiatives um, that they were like, OK, fine, Misty, you're in charge. Um, and I wasn't the technical expert, but I took those that that leadership opportunity to drive the engagement with the users and and getting everybody on board. So there was a lot of negotiating. And so I guess that's one piece of advice. I mean, you asked the advice for for young women on their careers is you don't have to be the technical expert to be the leader. Right. One of the key values of being an expert is knowing who else to listen to. Mm -hmm. And I that's fantastic advice. Yeah. So, so I was able to lead a number of internal projects. I got tapped to um, be a release manager and get certified in project management. So gosh, I don't know, it's been 20 something years that I've been certified, um, certifiable. Uh, and I was not going to make <laughs> that joke. Say, I was not going to go <laughs> there, but if you want to go there on your own, that's completely fine. So I am certified. Um, and I was the release manager for the very first release of ZOS, uh, which was interesting because it needed the hardware teams to work with the software teams. So again, I pulled on my ability to get different groups of people to work together and to clear roadblocks. Um, and then I went on maternity leave, which actually turned out to be a career opportunity because I was, I was gone for only about a year. And I came back part time. Everybody told me, you're not going to want to work full time after you have a child. You're going to want to stay home and raise the babies. And I'm like, mm, I don't know if that's who I am, but let me see. Well, I, I tried it and it wasn't for me. Um, staying at home as a stay at home mom is definitely not my thing. Um, I really need to be in the workplace and being technically challenged. So uh, I did take a part time job. I found I was able to contribute a full time impact in part-time hours and I learned a really valuable lesson and that is how much of our workday is spent on unnecessary stuff 
Um, and if you talk to any working mom, uh, and I guess I would say highly engaged working dads would know this as well, is you very quickly, because you're forced to, prioritize what's most important. You have to. It's a matter of survival. And so I think that contrary to popular opinion that I see in the press, even today, working parents are highly, highly effective because they know how to prioritize the most important things to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so then when I was ready to go back full time, um, I had been promoted enough that I knew if I didn't get a manager job, I would never be able to because it would be too high level. I'd be like going straight into a people manager at a director level and that doesn't work. Um, so I took a first line manager job at, in hardware development and I learned a lot. It was I jumped into management and hardware. I didn't know anything about either. And and I think that's an interesting sort of point and I'm, I'll stop you there for just a moment. I think the mainframe as a career gives you the ability to, it's such a broad church. You've got both the hardware, you've got the software, you've got the services, you've got the management, you've got the deployment of it. There's, you know, I spoke to Jose Castano on a previous show and you can kind of move through this platform as he has done and mm -hmm. have very different careers in the same technology domain. And it's interesting that you say it, you know, so many of the people I have on the show have, have kind of moved from hardware to software to services to, and kind of back around again and done something different. I love Jose. I worked with Jose back when he was a, a technical lead and I was a release manager, so I know him from way, way back. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I have the exact same experience. And, and when I talk to students, we didn't get to this part of my job role, but um, – my last job at IBM was leading the IBM Z academic initiative. So I talked to students all the time. And one of the things I would often say to them is mainframe is not one job. Mm -hmm. It's made there every kind of IT job you can think of for the most part, there's a mainframe version of that. So there's a mainframe database administrator. There's mainframe analytics right? There's mainframe blockchain. There's mainframe systems administrator. There's mainframe application developer. There isn't a mainframe game developer or a mainframe web developer, but pretty much anything else. <laughs> There's a mainframe version of it. Um, so it isn't really like going into mainframes is going into a job. It's, it's going into technology that is at scale and critical and essential. There's, there's no small work. There's no small job in the mainframe space. Everything that you do in this space is absolutely critical to that organization and probably to large numbers of people. So maybe let's pivot a little. I mean, this gives me a perfect segue. What are you doing now I mean, you've kind of, let's zero in. We've spent a little bit of time talking about your career arc and some of the jobs you've had. What's the cool stuff you're doing at Microfocus? We, ju we jump straight past that yeah. at the top of the conversation, yeah. but maybe just because I'm really, you and I speak all the time. I see what Microfocus is doing. I think it'd be really interesting to spend a few minutes talking about kind of what you're doing with clients, how that's working, because I think there's some interesting nuggets in there for sure. Well, I, I think that this connects very well to my IBM career because I really love IBM as a company. Um, but there's so much of the view is we need to keep everybody in the IBM ecosystem. And the world is much more broad than that. And there was a lot of that's cloud, right? We're mainframe. That's cloud. We're mainframe, that's distributed. They're out to steal our lunch. They just want to move everybody off of the mainframe. And I always felt like you really need to think more broadly. You need to think about the mainframe is amazing at what it does. So let's lean into that. Let's focus on what the mainframe can deliver of unique value that no one can touch, rather than trying to be everything to everyone. I, I literally had a technical leader um, at IBM tell me, why are you doing this game development project on 
another server, you could be doing that on a mainframe. Well, you could, but mainframe isn't really built for graphics delivery, right? So, so you know, use the tool for what it's best at. And MicroFocus really impressed me with their view of using the right tool for the job. You know, I literally once, when I was young and single, did not have a hammer and I wanted to put a nail in the wall to hang a picture. And I used the handle of a screwdriver to hammer a nail into the wall. It can work, you can make it work, but why not use a hammer if you have a hammer? And that is, that is my argument when it comes to IT, is use the tool for what it's best at, right? Um, instead of trying to make everything fit. I put it another way of just because the car was invented doesn't mean the train is obsolete. You know, right. the, I ride bikes, as you know. People can ride motorbikes with. There's helicopters out there. There's planes. There's trains. There's automobiles. There's everything in between and all variations of. Certain journeys are best done on certain forms of transport for certain reasons. You know, me turning up in Lycra to go on a flight tomorrow <laughs> Is probably not, it's never a pleasant sight anyway. But, but you know, I think the point is if you've got a platform and it's good at what it does, use it for what it's good for. If right. there's another platform that's better at what that platform does and that suits your workload, use that platform. I think increasingly that's becoming, and I'm going to lead us on with this, where sort of mainframe modernizations going. And I, I keen to get your perspective on that word that set of words i it was very interesting when i left ibm the number of people that sent me private messages and and you know basically called me a traitor um or i can't believe that you're leaving ibm to just kill the mainframe because they see that word of modernization and they assume that's all it means and Microfocus, and I've had long conversations with the general manager, with our CTO, with everyone. The microfocus point of view is that modernization is not about the IT. It's about the business. And it's about making the IT meet the modern needs of the business, not moving to modern technology, right? And so whatever you need to do to deliver that affordably with the least risk to deliver what the business needs today. That is modernization. And when I speak at conferences, I always, always, always include that. One of my favorite sessions that I just did in SHARE um, and I will be taking on the road is um, unconscious bias affects technologies as well as people. And there is bias you know, if you're in the mainframe space, you you know that there is bias against that word mainframe, right? As soon as somebody hears it, they assume old, outdated, inflexible, whatever, expensive. Um, we can have a long conversation about how some of that, that is true in some cases. It's not true in other cases. It's really not the mainframe that those things, it's how it's used. Um, but I would argue there's also bias against that word modernization, on both sides of this fence, the non-mainframe community assumes that modernization means moving off of the mainframe and moving to new technology. And it's on me as a modernization evangelist to explain to them how the mainframe could and should be a part of that strategy in the right places. It's not keep your mainframe, always keep your mainframe. It's look at it and decide what do you need to change? What do you not need to change in order to deliver what the business needs? I have the same issue with the mainframe community, right? Um, and I had multiple conversations at every conference that I've gone to since I joined Microfocus. It seems like the message is starting to get out there. So I'm I am hearing more and more people repeating that message. It makes it makes me very happy that I'm hearing more people say modernization is not about mainframe or cloud. It's not even about hybrid cloud. It's it's about finding the one the one solution for that one situation for that one business purpose that is right for that application 
in the same organization, you're going to have many, many different strategies. One application, you're not going to update at all, and you're going to leave it on outdated, unsupported processors because you rarely ever need it, and it's not business critical. Why invest in it at all? In other, in other places, you're going to modernize on the mainframe because you need the speed and the security that only that mainframe can deliver because of the unique hardware underneath it. Um, in other cases, you're going to say, you know what, I need to move this application to cloud. It's non-critical work. There's low value response to it. Or I really need that dynamic scale out opportunity that is better served on a cloud, right? You can scale out on a mainframe, but to a limit, right? So if you have massive dynamic scale out requirements, that's probably better delivered on a cloud. Right. So it really, really comes down to the particular application, the particular business need and what you're trying to accomplish. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, I think it's whether you use the journey analogy, whether you look at it from a workload placement, whether it's fit for purpose, whether it's what you just described. I think that's the level of pragmatism that I'm starting to see mm -hmm. uh, start to infuse that conversation around mainframe modernization. So. Great discussion there for a while. I'm going to make this personal, and again, I'm going oh, to go no. back. I'm okay. going to go back. Okay. Um, so you get the chance to go back just a couple of years to when you were 21, 22, finishing college, and you yes. get to give younger Misty, if such a thing were possible, obviously being as radiant as you are. But no, you get, the, all joking aside, you get the opportunity to go okay. back to younger Misty and give her some words of advice. What would those words of advice be? Um, don't turn down that cute guy you met at Woodstock. It took me, that my, that was my husband. <laughs> it took me, I turned him down the first time and then I realized it was a massive mistake and it took me a year to, to, to get him maybe, back. Maybe, maybe that's the reason why you're still married today. I don't know. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, no, you know what? I would say that, um, Go ahead and and dive into this mainframe thing. It, I think it took me a number of years to really invest in myself and my career and really see myself as a mainframer. You know, as I told you at the beginning, it I thought I was just going to be there for a couple of years. And even after I decided to not be a mathematician anymore and to stick with mainframes, it took me quite a long time to get into that mindset of, this is a career. It's not just what I'm doing today. I was very, you know, this is a fun project. I'll go do that. Oh, that's a fun project. I'll go do that. Oh, that's a fun. It worked out well for me for some reason. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it would have been better if I'd really like, and maybe some of that is, is unconscious bias from a, me thinking of myself as the second income instead of an income as as equal to my husband, right? So I think there was probably some of that going on as well, um, which is odd for a feminist to say, but yes, uh, unconscious bias, you can have a, for, that impacts yourself. You can internalize those, those things that you rail against all the time um, very easily. And I think that's probably would be my main advice is, you know, embrace, embrace this technology and praise your career path and, and, uh, Plan it out. I, I had a mentor that said, don't take the next job without planning where you're going to go after that. I Every mean, single career move. That's great advice. Think about what this job is going to mean for the next job after it. Yeah. Uh, the other question I ask every guest who comes on the show, and I think you're going to have a really interesting perspective on this, is where do you see this platform five years out i'm not talking about the next release i'm not talking about z17 I'm mm -hmm. talking you know look a little further out over the horizon and and where do you see the mainframe platform let's pick five years from there okay five years all right so um i do see a significant acceleration and modernization both on and off the platform um I do think that those smaller companies that are still on mainframe because they're just running on, you know, out of support hardware um, and they've only got one person in the company that that runs it and 
and it's like a very tiny footprint. I do think that they'll end up moving to the cloud. Um, it's just too hard to stand up and manage your own environment and keep it updated when you're that small. Um, but the larger organizations I do see doubling down on their mainframe because of the unique features that come from having all of that hardware physically. I mean, it's a physics thing, right? Uh, electricity takes time to go over a signal and having all of those processors and the crypto cards and the, and the IO processors packed so tightly in that box um, does have a material impact on, on how fast it can, it can work. Um, and the security features that are only possible when you control all of that hardware and you can make it custom built the way IBM has. Those are the, the two big things and, and probably some quantum as well, right? That we're just dipping into some of that quantum. Um, it's going to take more than five years really for quantum to be mainstream, right? We'll start seeing some of it um, by then, but the workloads that need to be on the mainframe will be modernized on the mainframe. Um, the only other thing that I really wish I could say is we would see some sort of simplification because the IT environment is just getting way, way, way too complex. Companies have a little mm -hmm. bit of this here and a little bit of that here and a little bit of this there. I wish I could say that I would see things simplifying. I am hearing people saying that they, you know, one of the reasons why they're reviewing modernization is they want to reduce their IT stack so they don't have to have so many varied skills across their organization. I think there's going to be only a small amount of movement on that, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's intrinsic motivations for an individual developer, for a CTO to be the first to try something. And you get rewarded socially and often financially for being the first in your organization to try something. So as much as they are successful in moving out, they're going to be bringing in as much new stuff because new languages are being written and you want to be the first to use that language, even though it provides no value, you convinced yourself that it is providing value because it's new and cool and you can you you really believe you really believe that you're bringing something of value to the organization, but unconsciously, what's going on in your head is this is new and cool, and I'll be the first. So, I'm sorry to be a little pessimistic on that part. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think chasing the shiny object, as I call it, is a is a trend. Yeah, Misty, this probably. has been a great discussion. As I say. We've been office neighbors, we're town neighbors. It's always good to talk to you. I think this has been a fa fascinating conversation. I think there's some unique perspectives you've got as you've planned a, a career from a mathematician to be a mainframer, but also doing that as a sort of powerhouse woman in the industry. So thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to chat with anyone about mainframe and modernization. Um, all the time. I always make time for people that have questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much for listening. We'll catch you on the other side. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to I Am A Mainframer. Liked what you heard? Subscribe to get every episode or watch us online at openmainframeproject.org. Until next time, this is the I Am A Mainframer podcast. Insights for today's mainframe professionals.